Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian reminder that you don't have to do the statism. Uh, brought to you by the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Catherine Mangue Ward, and filling in for a grieving Peter Suderman is a beloved Reason staffer, Eric Bame. Welcome, Eric, and welcome, everybody. Howdy. Happy hey, Monday. Matt. So if you haven't uh, paid attention to the news for a hot minute this past uh, 420 weekend, which Nick celebrates uh, every day of the year. Uh, yeah, was every kind weekend's of, 420, man. Uh, it was a bit of a, uh, on the Freedom Massacre side, wasn't all that awesome uh, for those of a libertarian persuasion, uh, although depending on how you look at it, we'll get into some of that. Uh, you had a rather sudden or belatedly sudden, not really sure how that works, um, congressional scores of billions thrown at financing overseas wars and defensive commitments, uh, reauthorization and strengthening of the notorious uh, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, colloquially known as FISA, uh, and uh, forcing TikTok to uh, decouple from the Red Chinese. You had the Biden administration restoring and making worse the notorious anti due process Obama administration title nine rules for adjudicating campus sexual assault accusations. China went after Apple's WhatsApp. Some U S courts made your phones less secure from unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, the Ivy league became like this crazy battleground between protesters, cops, and various other insane people. And Oh yeah. The uh, leading uh, GOP presidential uh, candidate is on trial uh, in lower Manhattan and people are setting themselves on fire. Uh, in protest. So, Catherine, it's kind of hard to know where to begin with all the frowny face stuff, but maybe let's start uh, here. Are, is there any element of the $95 billion uh, congressional uh, uh, vote over the weekend, um, the uh, Ukraine, the Israel, the Taiwan, the TikTok, is there any bit of that where you think, eh, that one's not so bad? I have to say, I came into this podcast pretty depressed about the events of the weekend, and your roundup just made it truly 10 times worse. Like, when you put it all together like that, you've you've already broken my spirit. No, I mean, this, this, was, this weekend was not great. And this is exactly the kind of business-as-usual stuff that... Um, that libertarians should be fighting and are fighting all the time. I mean, this is each of these things ended up being um, kind of bipartisan in their various ways. Um, these are all kind of the sort of stuff that we expect Congress uh, and um, the executive to do. And um, this was not like the reason this weekend was so depressing is because each of these things, the massive, massive amount of spending, the incursions on privacy, the restrictions on free association, um, you know, the the sort of pushback on due process, all of it is just ordinary things that we expect to happen in the course of governance. And this is why on this 420 weekend, now more than ever, have we considered anarchy? <laughs> Nick, you're the uh, the in-house non-anarchist or anti-anarchist, let's yeah. say. I'm not. Oh, yeah. Un-anarchist. Yes. Uh, Statist. Uh, There's a word for that, Matt. <laughs> yeah. I, it's no, right there. No, there we no. go. You know, if that's the kind of binary thing that leads to the world we live in now. Also, by mm. the way, everyone just paid You're like taxes. George Bush, but on the other side, if you're not, not with us, you're against us. Let's not leave out that everyone, you know, paid their taxes at the end of last week, too. So <laughs> not everybody. Not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That like decline is a choice. This is this Paying is your Nick taxes. and I are like I'm the anarchist yeah. who paid her taxes, yeah. and Nick is the statist who didn't, and that yeah. tells not, you everything you need to know. The uh, one of the you know tablets. Matt, as I was uh, <laughs> kind of rolling through all of the various things that we were talking about uh, in terms of spend, I mean just in terms of spending and money. One of the things that was really shocking to me is to remember not that long ago when people would say, okay, if you're going to do supplemental spending or if you're going to do extra spending, like you're going to cut something to keep it revenue neutral. Remember um, that? That world doesn't exist anymore. I mean, you know, maybe it's flying out beyond whatever Pluto is now. Uh, you know, but um, And just looking at uh, in 2023, the Fed spent $6.2 trillion, which was 38% more than the revenue collected. So 38 cents out of every dollar was borrowed. Um, and there is not even, apart from all of the specifics that we'll get into, just on the general level of things, what Republicans and Democrats are saying and the independents like Angus King, 
lest we forget, <laughs> and uh, Bernie Sanders, right, oh are God. saying is that we can just keep spending more and more. And, you know, 38 cents out of every dollar. Are we at war? No. Are we in a depression? No. Are we like, this is business as usual. And yeah, we are no, spending, you know, no prices, right? Yeah. Like I remember when I'm old enough to remember when we had to do all this spending now to like, uh, you know, restore demand um, because yeah. without demand, then everything's going to crash. And now there's just like, no, no, uh, the stimulus thing was like, oh, we're just going to do a stimulus and then we're going to withdraw it. It'll, it's just an injection, a one-time injection back in the days when I think that's the stimulus what, was, uh, that's what he said. Um, uh, the stimulus was back when the uh, Bron annual federal budget was at two point eight, two point nine trillion dollars, and it was around you know seven hundred billion. And people are like, gosh, that's a lot. Um, and uh, it was supposed yeah, to. Yeah, they a, couldn't a, spend eight hundred billion because that was too much. That nobody would stand yeah. for that. Uh, Eric, uh, we've heard two generalized uh, uh, expressions of woe. What is your generalized uh, lament? Looking at uh, gazing at <laughs> I have, sing, sing us a song I of sadness, a general Eric. Lament. Yeah, I'm good at that. Uh, I have a general lament, and then I, that I think will lead into a more specific lament. My general lament, uh, and this was already touched on, but I mean, to do this on 420, man. The next time <laughs> I hear. <laughs> the next time I hear the libertarians run everything, oh, you know, yeah. the Natcons love to make this argument. Oh, it's, you know, we've lived in this libertarian state of free trade and limited government for so long. And look how bad it's been for America, whatever. Like, come on, man. The week of, <laughs> of tax day, and then it's also 420, and that's when you're going to pass this collection of bills. But the more specific lament here is when you look at the actual vote totals. I know numbers on a podcast is not the way to go, but I'm going to run through some numbers here anyway. The FISA authorization vote in the Senate was 60 to 34, and that 60 yes was split evenly, 30 Republicans, 30 Democrats. I'm including Angus King and Bernie Sanders in the Democratic count there. So 50-50 split. Uh, the Ukraine vote in the House was 311 yeses, and it was 101 Republicans and 210 Democrats. The Israel vote in the House was 366 yeses. It was 193 Republicans, 173 Democrats. Uh, the Indo-Pacific spending bill, which was another one of these defense bills that was passed this weekend, same thing, 385 yeses, pretty much split evenly, 178 and 207. And then the TikTok ban was 360 yes votes. And again, I don't actually have the breakdown for that one, but it was split. It was bipartisan vote. Uh, there is a a bipartisan majority for all of these anti-libertarian things. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, I guess ultimately, like if anybody says libertarians are running things in D.C., that's obviously wrong. Uh, and it's and it's, I think, an interesting illustration of where uh, Congress is right now, where there is kind of this centrist faction, a centrist, very unlibertarian faction uh, that is controlling uh, not just the spending in the House, but some of these other big policy decisions, too, are being made uh, as they as they pretty much always are uh, down the middle with with opposition from both the, the left and right, uh, but clearly not enough of it. Catherine, um, so this is votes in the House of Representatives that uh, Eric is going through there, um, you know, the House of Representatives uh, is supposed to be closer to the people and feeling the people's passions and spirits. And the people of the United States, last I looked, uh, tend to be in favor of helping Ukraine and helping Israel, at least, and probably Taiwan, too. I haven't looked at that in a while. And I don't know the exact breakdown where people think about, you know, the red Chinese and TikTok and whatnot. But uh, is there not an argument of, uh, hey, we're just giving the people what they want, good and hard. That is indeed the argument. And um, and there is a place for that. I do think the American public's foreign policy thinking is uh, among its least sophisticated collective policy positions. And I say that understanding that all of the American public's policy positions are not very sophisticated or well thought through. Um, there's a, a sort of entire body of literature on public ignorance that is just utterly depressing and fascinating basically suggesting that um, Americans, but all people, have the power to hold A and not A in their minds um, simultaneously and to um, turn that into actionable political behavior. In this case, you know, Americans both do support um, supporting uh, Israel and Ukraine and recognize that getting involved in that conflict is an extremely dangerous thing to do. And they're just holding those two ideas in their minds. Um, and you you know, we've seen this already with Iran. Like this is you can only walk closer to the conflict. You, It's very, very hard to back away. And the U.S. is creeping ever closer to active involvement in a hot war in the Middle East. 
And uh, in the end, I just don't think that that is going to be helpful either um, to the players on the ground there or to the American public. Nick, is it worth thinking about uh, Ukraine and Israel somewhat differently um, when assessing uh, those things, given that Ukraine is a much poorer country, whereas Israel is richer on a per GDP uh, basis than Japan? Believe it or not, true fact. Um, is there is that worth bringing up or like weighing in? How does that uh, factor into your consideration? Well, I I think it's actually more uh, relevant to think about them, and you can still come to the same conclusion that we should not be involved at all. But we have actual defense agreements with Israel. Uh, and I don't think there's any question that the Middle East, uh, largely because of our past actions there over the past you know, 800 years or ho- however long the U.S. has been a country, um, have helped to destabilize it. But we have actual commitments in a way that we do not with Ukraine. I recommend that everybody read Joe Biden's message about why funding for Israel and Ukraine is so important. And that is a masterwork in kind of slippery slope and obfuca- obfuscation. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a few paragraphs in, he talks about how, like, what's really great about this is it's a jobs program for the U.S. Because as we, you know, give more countries more ammunition so that they can spend it, you know, they can use that, we replenish our, you know, top line stuff. So it's great. Everybody wins. Um, and, you know, it's really bad thinking. It's not strategic thinking. But I do think, you know, we we have fundamentally different a different relationship with Israel than we do with the Ukraine. Um, and also, by the way, you know, NATO is, uh, you know, Ukraine is not part of NATO. If you read Na- uh, NATO's official proclamations, you know, they're going to, you know, once the war stops, they're going to ent- have Ukraine enter NATO. Will that be better or worse? I'm not sure. But we should be, you know... We had a grand strategy in place during the Cold War. You can critique it. Uh, you can support it. The Cold War is over. We have not come up with a grand strategy uh, other than we should you know, invade as many countries and support as many countries uh, that we want to at any given moment for any given reason. But delinking all of these would be a good start to figuring out whether or not US involvement makes sense. Eric, uh, the other week, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Iran, whose actual pronunciation of the name of the country I know is different, but uh, I'm too old to start learning new tricks, um, uh, sent in more than 300 missiles and projectiles and drones into Israel, uh, the vast majority of which were intercepted by the Iron Dome and the David Sling and other things with cute names um, uh, that were developed hand in hand with U.S. technology and uh, paid for by aid bills like this. So my question is, why do you want Israel to be bombed? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I don't want Israel to be bombed. I don't want anyone to be bombed. Uh, I would like all these conflicts to cease. Uh, I you know, have no power over that, unfortunately. And I don't think Congress really does either for that matter. Um, I, I, I will get to answering this question in a second, but I, I think I will push back on something that Nick said. I was thinking through this weekend, knowing I was going to come on this podcast, like, OK, how would I vote on these bills? Uh, the FISA bill and the TikTok ban, those things are non-starters, obviously, because it's like major erosions of the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment, and that's just fully a non-starter for me. Uh, when we're talking about the aid bills, though, something Nick said earlier is exactly right. Uh, if you want to, uh, and, and Matt, you made this point too, that like if, if you want to spend money on something, okay, uh, show me what we're cutting. Like what, where are the priorities here, right? If, if $60 billion for Ukraine is a priority, what is a lesser priority that we are going to take that money out of? And if I was a member of Congress and, uh, you know, I, I would start from a place of no, I think, on both these aid bills. But I would say, hey, Speaker Johnson, if you can show me where the 60 billion is coming from for Ukraine and the, and the 30 billion for Israel, uh, then we can have a negotiation about that. We can decide where the priorities are, because that's the thing that budgeting ultimately is, is a is a ranking of priorities. And it's the thing that Congress doesn't ever do anymore because we just pass all these emergency spending bills and we don't we don't try to balance them. Uh, so we should do that. But I think I would be a harder no uh, on, on it would be a harder uh, task to get me to vote for the, the Israel bill for exactly the point that you made earlier, Matt, which is that Israel's a wealthy country uh, and that I think there is a there's some internal logic. I don't think I fully agree with it. In fact, I, I know I don't fully agree with it, but I think there is some internal logic to the idea that if we don't stop Russia and Ukraine, we're going to be fighting them in Romania or Poland or Estonia or something like that. Uh, again, I don't fully buy that argument, but I think there's at least some sort of justification there 
for continuing that and supporting that conflict there. Whereas Israel, okay, in the immediate aftermath of October 7th, I understand we have commitments there. But it's now been six months. They are engaged in what looks like a war of choice in Gaza, uh, a very destructive war there. Uh, and, and we're not going to be fighting Hamas in Poland or in Western Europe or in Kansas. Uh, that, is, that is a conflict that is entirely contained in that one geographical area. It is but a Columbia University Israel has to you know, manage on their still, own. Yep. Uh, it is yeah, a conflict we'll that Israel has to be responsible it's for the, managing. Uh, Westernmost colony of Hamas, Matt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so, I mean, I, I would be a start from a place of no on both those bills, but no. I think it would be an easier uh, task to get to yes on Ukraine if you were making offsetting cuts. I uh, just to follow up on that real quick, I, I don't disagree on anything that would prioritize stuff where I what I think is important for the U.S. in the Middle East. And actually, this is also true in in Middle Europe as well. Um, you know, what are are we doing any kind of dip, diplomatic negotiations or whatever? The reason, you know, I, I believe that Hamas essentially did what it did partly at uh, Iran's urging or enthusiasm or aid or support. Iran is trying to destabilize the Middle East because once the U.S. actually left the region, you know, primarily, I mean, obviously we still have people there and things like that, uh, between the Abraham Accords and then, you know, a burgeoning relationship with Saudi Arabia, you could see how a bunch of Muslim Arab countries in the region were starting to say, you know what, Israel is is going to be here for a while. We can work with Israel. Israel is not trying to destroy us the way that Iran is and its proxies in Syria and Lebanon, et cetera. And I, you know, this is part of the biggest problem with foreign policy. And I can remember over a, a decade ago, I think, talking to a couple of people who were saying, you know, the, the biggest problem with the military budget is that all of it goes to bases overseas and to armed forces rather than diplomatic things. And that somewhere after World War II or during the Cold War, the State Department became a kind of subservient tool of the Defense Department. And we need to reverse that because what would be great is a Middle East where Israel and Saudi Arabia and UAE and a bunch of other countries have stabilized the region in a way that it does you know, it, we don't have to be involved. I think we can. I, I, I tend not to think that Putin is expansionist in the way that I think a lot of uh, his staunchest critics do. But there is NATO there, which we're obviously implicated in, and Europe, uh, European countries, at least France and Poland, ha particularly Poland, have really stepped up to contain that threat. I think beyond the borders of Ukraine. 100% agree that diplomacy is the way to go. I'll just throw that in there. Totally agree with Nick on that. Like we, we need more diplomacy in both of these situations and in many other situations around the world. I think diplomacy in the Middle East is active. The question is, is it is it successful and is it and and like what can it accomplish? I mean, uh, the Biden administration's on the phone constantly having to do with hostage negotiations and and uh, other things besides and are holding levers over uh, Qatar and Egypt uh, with uh, foreign aid. Uh, Qatar, which thank God is a, uh, a major non-NATO ally. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're all glad yeah. about that. That's, we've um, got one of our biggest military bases in Qatar, and I'm sure that the Hamas leadership who live there probably have PX privileges. Just th this is ultimately what all this money is about, right? If if we are, and this is why I remain even skeptical of the diplomatic relations approach, which is that people are hearing us out because we're writing them checks or selling them weapons. And that's just a fundamental underlying truth. They are, they are not hearing us out because of our moral gravity or our status as a you know, world power. Um, they are hearing us out because we are writing them checks. And um, that's, a, that's a contingent relationship that just gets increasingly expensive. And, you know, Joe Biden wants to say that this was, you know, uh, bil billions for U.S. weapons manufacturers, which is already not a great argument, <laughs> but um, it is, in fact, also just billions to buy uh, people answering our phone calls. And then we're not even accomplishing very much with those phone calls. Although those billions helped Jordan and Egypt make peace with Israel. So like there's the, some sometimes those and, and make Israel make peace with them. Uh, too, back when Israel was a much poorer country than it is now. Like it, there's some track record of uh, the leverage being leverageable, uh, whether or not it's uh, wiser or whatnot. I want to go quickly to TikTok before we peace out of this uh, unpeaceful uh, part. Um, uh, Nick, I know you were uh, exercised about it. And we've talked about the TikTok um, ban, a forced divestiture um, uh, previously on this podcast. 
Uh, you know, I see Ben Dominic out there <laughs> saying that uh, you lost grifters um, out there. Um, there's some people who are like, hey, look, this is good. The Chinese are an adversary and we are getting the adversary's thumbprints out of your 15 year old daughter's iPhone. Uh, what's the big deal with that? What is your uh, response now that this is looking absolutely likely it's going to happen? Um, why should we? Uh, why should we be sad about this? There is no demonstrated harm right now that what TikTok is doing or ByteDance is doing is jumping to the tune of the CCP with any of the data that is you know sequestered on American servers, et cetera. This in and of itself, it's stupid because what TikTok is collecting is not actionable data and they are not the reason, you know, it's not TikTok algorithms are the reason why uh, protesters at Yale and Columbia and everybody under 50 now is objectively pro Hamas. Um, this is just a moral panic and a scare um, about stuff. And it's, you know, in and of itself, it's terrible. It sets a terrible uh, precedent as I believe it was Rand Paul uh, wrote about it. Reason, it is unconstitutional. There is nothing to be gained by this other than, you know, a Shirley Jackson short story level, you know, kind of bloodletting for, uh, you know, for people who are, are out of touch with basic reality. Would note that two of the four people on this podcast are under the age of 50. Uh, Eric, uh, you love Hamas. Um, but beyond that, uh, <laughs> Uh, can you talk about the TikTok thing through the lens of global trade, which is a topic that you write about a lot? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, I think Ben Dominic uh, should probably remember that he once lost a job because he got caught taking money from a foreign government to advocate for things. So before he Shots starts fired. accusing other people of being grifters, he should probably uh, think about his own history. Uh, as far as global trade goes, or as far as the TikTok ban goes, uh, look, uh, things like VPNs exist. Uh I was traveling in Europe last year during the uh, NCAA tournament, and I was able to watch American broadcasts of basketball games that are technically not allowed to be broadcast in Europe because of contractual deals, because I had a VPN that would tell those networks my phone was in the United States of America. Uh, kids will just do that in reverse. Uh, so the TikTok ban, yeah, it's a, it's a bloodletting, but I think it's also kind of an ineffective bloodletting. I have yet to see a compelling argument for how that Congress will stop VPNs from uh, from uh, getting around that ban. And uh, and so, like, this is ultimately good news, right? The good news is that the Internet is, you know, even though we keep trying to put up walls and fences and we keep trying to make it less and less free, uh, it is ultimately a pretty free place. And uh, there are still ways to get around the stupid barriers that governments are building. Uh, all right. Uh, on uh, Friday, the uh, Biden administration unveiled its final uh, Title IX regulation rewrite uh, for how colleges handle sexual assault allegations. The piece that Emma Stone wrote for uh, Reason.com. Uh, Emma Stone was... wrote for Reason. I mean, I did, <laughs> yeah. That's the 17th time I've done this in this podcast. Woo. It's like in She also of... did it. She did it in yellow face, which Is was it... the real uh, surprise. There's like Not that she wrote for us. Two Emmas in this world. I could be going <laughs> yeah. Emma Goldman. I mean, it's just like there's yeah. a lot of different... <laughs> Ways we can go, uh, it's uh, it's a shtick, I guess. Um, anyways, uh, Emma Camp's headline, shout out to Emma Camp, uh, great reporter, uh, uh, was a new Title IX rules erase campus due process protections. Uh, Catherine, can you give us a sense of why what happened uh, was, was bad and what the practical effects of the badness will be, could be? Yeah, the two night, the, the, <laughs> the new <laughs> Title IX rules. I can't even say it. I'm so upset. Wow. Um, the new Title IX rules are bad on kind of two levels. The first level is the procedural level, which is, I guess, we're just going to ping pong back and forth. Uh, anytime there is a new administration, they will eventually get around to just reverting the rules to the previous rules. Um, and this will happen forever and ever. Um, this is bad because the natural equilibrium for colleges will be to essentially stick with the stricter standard. Um, that is to say, to, to stick with the uh, larger number of DEI bureaucrats, to stick with the kind of, um, you know, the version of this that that Biden has put back into place now. Um, the second is that they're just bad on their own merit. So um, first of all, we now have we reverted to the single investigator model. That basically means one person uh, in uh, on the college campus will be um, judge and jury. Um, this is not 
great for all of the reasons that our adversarial judicial system suggests. Um, Also reverting to the preponderance of evidence standard. So this basically means there's one person who's like, eh, this is like 51 percent of the evidence suggests guilt. (laughs) Good enough. (laughs) Good enough. Um, Also, uh, no longer are students um, guaranteed any kind of a a hearing, um, nor are they guaranteed access to all of the evidence against them. So um, none of this makes sense from the perspective of a world where you want to have, you know, the supposed elites of this world or the people who are going to run things have a respect for an understanding of due process. Um, it also will ruin lives, not um, not in the sense that these people will go to jail, because, of course, again, these are not real criminal proceedings. They are just unaccountable private um, private um, life ruiners. And, um, you know, I guess my final thought is that initially this stuff was to protect the students themselves from being a part of the ju- the legal system that everyone else is a part of, right? Like originally the reason that colleges wanted to handle these complaints internally was so that they could coddle their students. This was not to do justice to uh, people who had misbehaved. It was to protect the nice little college boys from the police. And um, I just think that this is clearly a system that can be hijacked by whoever is in power. And at the moment, the people who are in power are people who would like to see all of these standards lowered. They would like to see everyone um, just kind of shoveled through the machine uh, of their accusations as quickly as possible. It's bad news. It's all bad news. This is like a terrible turn of events on college campuses, which are not even equipped to think or talk about this right now because they are also on fire <laughs> due to a uh, conflict on the other side of the world. What is the, I, 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 Matt, I'm sorry to uh, jump in, but like, I'm even curious, what is the political constituency for a Title IX change now? Um, because, you know, this is, it's kind of like net neutrality or something like that. You always have a group that, no, we need to have this. We need to have this. Biden was largely responsible for the Title IX uh, rules that kind of came into being under Obama. Those went away and there was not in any way, shape or form suddenly an efflorescence of like sexual assaults on campuses that we're hearing about. This is like, why would you go back to this at this point, you know, in a political term, et cetera, where there is absolutely no clear need for a shift back to an earlier version? I'm just like left wondering what is the uh, what's the political calculus of this? I think it's special interest dues paying, right? I mean, this is one of the things on the list of, you know, Biden said, and I'm going to do what's right for women. I mean, it's the sort of, you know, on on a very simple level, he's checking the boxes for um, potential voting demographics. And there are some people for whom this is a major issue. Um, I would say a lot of those people probably um, overlap with abortion voters and other people who are who are already going to back Biden. But you know, to him, there is almost no cost to checking this box, you know, yeah. just put it all back. Um, and um, to the people who are actually on these campuses and certainly to the accused, the cost is quite high. The one uh, case where a 51 percent preponderance of the evidence standard, the one case that I would endorse that in is any future remakes of 12 Angry Men, which mm-hmm. is a stupid, boring movie. And if you could get out of the jury room that much quicker, I'm all for it. Uh, Eric, there's been a lot of uh, discourse uh, over the past six months, at least the, uh, to my attention, where people are pondering, like, have we already passed peak woke, right? And that's an, uh, an overall bad term, but like the fevers that uh, struck uh, first in Me Too and then in the post-George Floyd universe and a lot of public um uh, social media kind of shaming and ganging up on people and driving people out of polite society. It feels like kind of the, that sense of, of uh, due process dismissal has lessened and there's less of that uh, kind of shaming and driving out people and whatnot. And so a lot of people said, hey, I mean, maybe we're past it. We're past peak woke. What does this um, institutional move tell us uh, about kind of that question and the things that are important in determining uh, whether uh, whether we are uh, respecting due process or not. 
Yeah. Um, well, I would just second most of what Catherine said. I thought that was a really good assessment of all the problems here. I think what this mostly says about uh, college is it. Mo- what it mostly says is how old I am is actually what this is all about. Um, <laughs> it is really all about you. <laughs> as yeah. as, it is as about the youngest you. person on no. this podcast, uh, I graduated from college in 2009, which doesn't feel to me like it was all that long ago. And yet every time I read, whenever I read Robbie's coverage of this or Emma's coverage of this uh, or anything else out there in the media, it is it, it makes me feel like I must be a 60 year old man, which I think I am on some level anyway. But uh, but man, it just feels like stuff changed so quickly uh, because none of this was part of the conversation or if it was, it was, you know, a fringy kind of thing uh, when I was in school. And uh, so to actually answer your question, I think I think we are past uh, peak woke. And I think in some way, I don't want to say that this doesn't matter because this is a serious erosion of, of due process rights. And I think there will be people who get railroaded through these kangaroo courts as a result of this change. Uh, but I do hope. Yeah, that's a great one, right? You love that one. Oh, God. That's <laughs> I was a was great metaphor. Right I was trying to breathe yeah. through the kangaroo was, railroad, yeah. and I can't. That's great. Those uh, there, kangaroos there really are terrible on trains. Uh, you know, they, they don't, don't stay in their society. Can't let them drive the train for sure. <laughs> Uh, but I, but I do hope that, that because that moment has passed culturally, maybe this time around, this will be less significant, uh, or it'll be less harmful. Uh, still seems like a really bad, you know, as Catherine laid out, I thought really well, like this is a, this is a bad idea for a lot of reasons. It reminds me, uh, relatedly of, uh, what, uh, Greg Luciano from fire long said, um, in the early aughts. Uh, and wrote about for reason, which is that even though at that point, uh, the thing that was in the rearview mirror was political correctness, which is a big issue in the 90s and then died. Um, he pointed out like, no, no, PC never died. Um, it actually uh, became institutionalized and you're just not hearing about it as much. But um, the structures are being built that are going to sort of enforce it and just, you know, set your watch. Um, and it I think it becomes less of... sexy and less interesting to cover. I think that's that's maybe one concern here. But I guess what I could summarize what I just said in, in a sentence, it would be that, like, you know, it's a bad policy if your hope is that, well, maybe it won't matter. Like, if that's the only good thing we can say right. is, like, maybe this won't be as significant. Maybe uh, this major yeah. policymaking will be purely symbolic. Right. It will be a speech act only. Like, great. Awesome. It's the same Crushing thing on it. the TikTok ban. It's like, well, if you can say, well, uh, well, hopefully kids will find ways around it with VPNs. Like, well, OK, that should tell you this was a stupid idea in the first place. It's the same. So, uh, Hunt, let's get our headline uh, Slack channel uh, uh, started early. Uh, LOL, eat at Arby's, I think is what we're, we're uh, going to from this episode. All right, we're going to get uh, to our listener email uh, of the week here in a moment. First, a sponsored message from our pals over at Donors Trust. Friends, are you passionate about preserving civil liberties and individual freedom? Of course you are. Do you desire to support organizations that uphold these principles, yet find it a struggle to navigate the complex world of charitable giving? Well, here is the perfect solution for y'all. A giving account with Donors Trust. A giving account, also known as a donor-advised fund, is a simple, secure, and tax-advantaged way for libertarian givers like you to support the causes you care about most. With a donor advised fund, uh, you can make a contribution, receive an immediate tax deduction, and recommend grants to your favorite charities over time. Best of all, you retain control over how your charitable dollars are being invested, ensuring that they align with your values and goals. Whether you're passionate about defending free speech, protecting property rights, promoting limited government, restoring all the stuff that we talked about losing the first half of this podcast, a giving account with Donors Trust empowers you to make a meaningful impact. To get started, uh, go to www.donorstrust.org slash roundtable and begin making even more of a difference in the fight for freedom. That's www.donorstrust.org slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. And Nick, at some point, will stop laughing. All right. Reminder to email your short queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Heather Mohorn, who writes, Dear Roundtable, I hope you might answer this question in honor of my husband, Joe, for his 40th birthday. Happy birthday, Joe. Uh, what is the steel man case? That means the best possible sort of case, assuming good faith on the other side, uh, in favor of the Jones Act or as Joe's brother calls it, that boat rule you hate. (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, Many thanks for the enlightening and entertaining content. Uh, Eric, you have written and podcasted about the Jones Act. In the past, 
I invite you to put on your uh, boat loving hat for a moment and make it sound as best you can. I'll let the kangaroos drive the boat, maybe. Yes. Uh, I think you should put on your boat shoes, yeah. actually. Oh, the boat and, shoes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the way to go. Uh, happy birthday, Joe. This is this is great, actually. Um, I love I love the, like, you know, let's make the steel man case uh, for these things. That's a great question. Uh, so I'll just actually go right to the source here on this, to the, uh, the American Maritime Partnership, which is one of the biggest uh, groups that supports the Jones Act and, and pushes to keep it in place, even though uh, so many of us are raging against it all the time. Um, and if you go to their page on the Jones Act, right at the top, in bold, it says the Jones Act is critical to the military strategy of the United States, which relies on the use of U.S. flagships. And then further down the page, there's all sorts of other stuff in here about like the ways in which, you know, the, the Jones Act will make sure that we have merchant marines and we'll have uh, cargo terminals and uh, intermodal equipment and all this all this other stuff that the market would provide, I think, even if you didn't have the Jones Act. But I think that argument right at the top, really the best argument for the Jones Act is that, hey, look, sometimes the United States gets into wars. And when we're in wars, we need uh, to be able to uh, we need we need ships and sometimes we need to build ships quickly. Uh, and uh, and that that we'd have to have this protectionist law that says we will, you know, in times of peace, uh, kind of fence ourselves off from competition in the shipbuilding market. So that when we urgently need to build ships in the time of war, we have the facilities and we have the manpower and we have the knowledge to do that without having to rely on other countries. Um, and I guess I should have prefaced it by just saying the Jones Act. What the Jones Act does is it says that you can't ship things from one American port to another American port unless that ship is built in the United States, flying a United States flag, registered in the United States, crewed by uh, Americans, all of that. Uh so the, the steel man case here is that, you know, we need the Jones Act in case of war. I think in, in practice, I think this is really flawed because we have uh, really close partnerships uh, and, and we have our really close allies with places like South Korea and the Netherlands, which are the two, the world's two best shipbuilding countries. They have the best technology. They build the best ships. Uh, there's no fear of the United States going into war without, you know, being able to have a supply of ships. And uh, and I don't know how important ships are to war anymore anyway. Uh, but uh, that's, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, this is all about national security. I'm worried now that the Dutch are listening and they're going to be like, fuck it, we control the world. <laughs> you know, they, again, there have been times when the Dutch believed yeah, that. So I, I don't know, I don't know that that's right now. The other thing, uh, the Jones Act is good for Liberia. You know, because a ton of ships get flagged out of Liberia. Yeah, now. that's that's true. Uh, Catherine, I you, realize you uh, don't just, care. But the rest uh, of us do. Uh, no, I was just like uh, trying to place uh, Liberia on a map. It's capital um, city, Monrovia. Uh, Monrovia. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quick thinking, uh, uh, Gillespie. Uh, Catherine, you recently published a cover uh, story um, in Reason Magazine about how we're running out of ammo. Um, does this is there a, a steel man case for that the Jones Act makes it so that we can do war boats better because we're running out of them? Yeah, I mean, I would probably give a like a less charitable version of what Eric just said, which is to say, as long as we are going to keep picking fights all around the world or getting involved in other people's fights all around the world, there is a reasonable possibility that we might end up fighting with everybody who makes boats. And then we might need to make our own boats. Like, that's true. That's a true sentence, I guess, as far as it goes. Um, it doesn't seem super likely that we would get in that precise configuration. Uh, but this is the justification for all protectionist policies. You know, somewhere at the bottom of every justification for every protectionist policy is, but what if, hypothetically, we got in a big bad fight of either a war or a trade war with every single other entity that makes rolled steel or every single other entity that makes sugar or every single other entity that makes helium or whatever. And so then we we have to have our own capacity and reserves of those things. Um, I suppose it depends on how much you handicap the likelihood that the U.S. will get in enough stupid conflicts to no longer be able to profitably and easily trade with the world. Uh, it is my profound hope that we would not be in that position, but it's not impossible. The The other big practical downside here is that by we've now had the Jones Act on the books for over 100 years. It was passed in 1920. A uh, hundred years of protectionism has actually hurt American shipbuilding capacity, not helped it because we there, there's no competition with the rest of the world. So so our shipyards have fallen way behind 
in terms of the the speed, it, it costs a lot more. It takes a lot longer to build a ship in the United States. Than They're just like knocking down really yeah. big trees and digging them out. Like we're right. just making canoes because that's uh, so yeah. we've actually harmed our national security because now if we did find ourselves in a shooting war with like say China and we needed to build a bunch of boats real fast, we've actually because of a law that was meant to conserve that technological progress and know-how, we've actually cost ourselves the technological progress and know-how that we need to quickly churn out boats. And there's actually quite a bit of concern about this uh, within the Pentagon and within the Navy and within the shipbuilding community right now. Uh, and th of course, the solution there is, well, we just need more subsidies. There's a big push going on right now within the shipbuilding uh, lobbying uh, to get Congress to, to subsidize harder like facilities that are capable of building Navy vessels. Uh, yeah, the, which the last like Navy the vessel answer. was built, yeah. the last ship was built like 20 years ago or, so, or launched yeah. 20 Real years talk. ago. So if we end up in a war where we really, <clears throat> really need suddenly a bunch of warships, we're just going to go and have Elon Musk figure out it's going to be X boats. And we're just yeah. <laughs> That's what it's going to be, like, for real. Or I mean, it's I'm gonna saying be that planes, which we also have now, which that's is actually not you know, like boats is another name oh, yeah. for yeah. rockets. We don't even really actually, need all these yeah. boats anymore. Like, but anyway, yeah. Elvis needs X boats, as Mojo Nixon uh, taught us. Um, let's go quickly, and again, probably starting with Eric, since you wrote about it. The uh, Section S seven hundred two reauthorization uh, came uh, happened. Uh, it's going to get signed into law if it hasn't already. Uh, it is perhaps a little bit even worse than advertised. And it's also coming at a time when the Ninth Circuit is making decisions about cops being able to force you to, to put your thumbprint on your phone to open it up or, or whatnot. Uh, Eric, can you give us a sense of what was particularly uh, noxious about uh, this latest version of the workaround of the requirement, Fourth Amendment requirement, that you should really have a warrant before searching through American stuff? Yeah, so this was the reauthorization of uh, FISA Section 702. We talked about it a little bit earlier on the podcast, but uh, just to recap for people who aren't aware, uh, what this uh, part of the law uh, allows U.S. intelligence agencies to do is to scoop up communications between Americans and foreigners, so communications that are going into or out of the country. Uh, then all those communications get dumped into a big database for uh, stopping terrorism reasons, and uh, in some circumstances, in a lot of circumstances, uh, the FBI and other uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies can then query that database and therefore look at communications from Americans uh, without having to first get a warrant or without having to get a real warrant. You have to go in front of like a, a fake judge, a, a visa court special, you know, national security judge to get that permission. Um, and the FBI uh, has has abused this ability to query this database. Uh, I think it's fair to say something, you know, millions of queries have been run in a single year. Uh, even the like White House's own watchdog on this has said, whoa, 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 this is probably a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, so this comes up periodically, has to be reauthorized. It was last reauthorized during the Trump administration, ironically enough, given that President Donald Trump is not a fan of it, but he signed it. Uh, and it has now been reauthorized again uh, on Saturday, uh, late Saturday night. For about 50 minutes, we were free of this because they passed it. Uh, they they passed it at 12.50 Good thing that's when I did Sunday. my crimes. Yeah. So get in, get in all that talk then. Uh, the, the really concerning thing here, aside from all the other existing stuff in Section 702 that is concerning, is there's then a, a new expansion of these uh, surveillance powers that was included in this bill. Um, and uh, what this part of the bill says, I and, and J.D. Tuchili both wrote about this last week. Uh, the provision says, quote, uh, the uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not reading from the bill here. Hold on. The bill says, quote, uh, any service provider with access to equipment that is being or may be used to transmit or store end quote, electronic communications, uh, is now also subject to the government's ability to surveil, basically. Uh, they did specifically exempt things like coffee shops and hotels from this, but effectively what this law now says is that if you uh, maintain or have access to uh, any sort of physical stuff, equipment that is connected to the internet, the government is allowed to persuade you to turn over information about whose communications is going through that. So this already this this provision basically already applied to telecom companies before this, but now it applies to uh, not just internet service providers but to anyone who maintains uh, internet equipment. Uh, potentially meaning, you know, the groups like First Amendment groups have raised concern that this could mean like newsrooms, for example, like reason.com could be subject to 
uh, having to comply with government orders about uh, surveillance here. So it means that sources and reporters may not necessarily know if their uh, newsroom is effectively bugged by the by the FBI or by the CIA uh, in a in a backdoor kind of way. Uh, very concerning. I think lots of civil liberty groups, First Amendment groups, uh, big tech lobbying groups all raised concerns about this, and uh, Congress went ahead and did it anyway. Well, at least, Nick, uh, we'll get the sweet mm -hmm. tax break for uh, your and yeah. my salary. Uh, in yeah, the for state local reporting. Uh, you know, if the CIA is going to start bugging everything again, the least they can do is, you know, is uh, bankroll quality uh, cultural magazines like they did Not back wrong. during the Cold War. You know, so Encounter some, was uh, a great magazine. Art. Yeah. You know, why not? Uh, let's fund the next Jackson Pollock. The, the only good thing coming out of this is that uh, the reauthorization is for two years instead of four or more. So, um, you know, that's kind of good news. But like when you see the steamroller process by which this happens and Eric alluded to it before, you know, Trump, Trump oddly is against 702 and yet he reauthorized it when he was president. Um, I don't know. That sounds like bullshit to me. You know, it's like, I'm going to be there. I'm going to come over to your Passover dinner, but I just can't make it tonight, you know, but I'm there in spirit. Like, um, but to, hopefully this will be two years and out. So I doubt it. Uh, thank you for work, uh, working on that Passover reference, uh, Nick, uh, since I admitted it at the beginning. Catherine, um, as an anarchist and someone who's eating at Arby's now uh, pretty regularly, have you switched that moment in your life where every transaction is either uh, cash or uh or uh, like the dark web uh and uh you're you're hiding all your your uh thumbprints uh matt i don't know if you know this but if you're not doing anything wrong you don't have anything to fear oh, oh okay cool so uh that is uh as as a uh, charter member of the uh not doing anything wrong group i have uh, i have nothing to fear no i mean this is like actually this is i think a good point which is of course, you can do things to to protect yourself. You can use VPNs. You can s switch to a pin instead of uh, biometrics. But I deeply resent that the federal government's fecklessness has taken all these conveniences from me. I I think it's flatly absurd that some of the coolest stuff that we've come up with is a you know dangerous technology to use just because these idiots can't mind their own business. And that is fundamentally, you know, I, I in a list of proposed um, reforms to the to 702, uh, like the third thing on the list was um, a little extra scrutiny if um, a query to this uh, this data set is made against uh, religious organizations or prominent figures in religious organizations. And I fully had the thought, is it time to establish the Church of KMW? Like I, I you know, amen. I could do it. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> You're you are my first follower. Let's go. Um, like I could do that. It might be even kind of fun in a horrible eat at Arby's way, but uh, I shouldn't have to. I we shouldn't have to be thinking about this. And uh, the fact that uh, we have this sort of bipartisan agreement that, um, in fact, our privacy does not matter. That the Fourth Amendment is up for debate. Um, is it totally sucks. I want to use my thumb to unlock my phone. And I don't want to have to worry about it. Gosh darn it! Uh, thank you, Empress Catherine. You have to work on your title, whatever that I might be. I don't think be. it's Empress. Um, I don't think that's a religious title. Yeah, I. It could it, be. I mean, it's your church. I mean, it has been world historically from time to time. That's true. Holy actually. Roman, you know. Holy, <laughs> yeah. holy Roman. Empress. Well, it was neither holy nor Roman, Matt Well, neither am I, Nick. Hmm. So it's fine. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get to our end of podcast. Uh, what we have been consuming in the cultural arena since uh, Roman uh, Catholicism was referenced. Nick, why don't you lead us off? Uh, I listened to the most recent episode of Blocked and Reported, uh, the uh, podcast that Katie Herzog and Jesse Single do. Uh, because, well, I listened to it anyway, but uh, because Billy Binion of Reason was on it. And uh, as a uh, guest host, and he and Katie Herzog talked a lot about Stephen Crowder and about hypocrisy on the right, um, it's a really great uh, episode. And Billy showcases the kind of deep dive uh, reporting that he does. And it kind of talks about the way in which the right wing media scape is starting to fall apart. Uh, you know, you saw this a while ago with uh, Candace Owens. Um, Stephen Crowder now uh, has lost the backing even of Canadian white nationalists, as if there's any other kind, uh, Lauren Southern and things like that. So it's 
you know, it's a fascinating world when, uh, you know, empires, whole civilizations are rising above, uh, rising in front of us and then uh, killing each other. So I recommend Blocked and Reported on in general, but especially when Billy Binion is the uh, guest host. Yeah, shout out to uh, Jesse Single for uh, uh, co-hosting a podcast that he doesn't show up on. Um, that's uh, that's a oh, yeah, like, no, it's a, hashtag. I, we should all be I, so lucky. Yeah, I suspect that he is uh, probably performing some kind of terroristic threats during that window when FISA 702 wasn't in, in force. Yeah, just a uh, yeah. Uh, I could make a joke there, but poor Jesse, I think he's probably suffered enough over the years. We'll let him go uh, for a second. Uh, Eric, what what have you consumed? Uh, I read uh, 1774, The Long Year of Revolution by Mary Beth Norton. This book came out a few years ago, but it's, uh, as it suggests, a, a history book about the year 1774. And this is 2024. This is the beginning of the 250th uh, anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and all that stuff. Uh, but the war, the conflict, uh, the, the revolutionary conflict really kicked off, uh, she argues, in this book in 1774. Uh, it covers the period from December 1773, which was the Boston Tea Party, all the way up until Lexington and Concord. It kind of ends right as that conflict is starting in uh, April of 1775. And uh, the book is really mostly concerned with a part of revolutionary history that I had never thought about before, which is the ways in which other colonies reacted to the events of the Boston Tea Party. And of course, it takes time because it took you know weeks in some cases for people to learn about this. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, I think we think of the Boston Tea Party as this like heroic moment, right, that like galvanized armed support against the British. And it's like a, a giant like middle finger to the you can't tax us, we'll throw the tea in the harbor kind of thing. But at the time, and I think totally understandably, it was it was kind of looked at even by other people who favored greater independence from Britain. Uh, it was looked at as as kind of scary. It was like this is a an incident of mob rule in Boston. Uh, the reactions in places like Philadelphia and Charleston in particular were uh, were actually somewhat negative to what Boston had done, and and people there, even even figures like uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was you know part of the the uh, the movement to you know get more independence from England, uh, felt like what the Bostonians was were doing was really going to hurt America's cause because it was going to cause a crackdown from England, which of course it did. Uh, and then the book also kind of goes through how that crackdown actually furthered the cause of the the radical faction within the revolutionaries uh, so there's this kind of this interesting conflict that i think has resonance today of uh, you know moderates and and radicals both of whom want more freedom from the government that they see as overbearing but there's quite a bit of disagreement over how to go about that uh, and the book goes through in in like quite detail uh, quite interesting detail over how that conflict played out in 1774 uh, and ultimately of course the the radicals more or less won uh, two more little things that I that I didn't know before that I learned from the book that I think is interesting. One is that the term unconstitutional actually existed within American political society before we had a constitution. Like this would get thrown around in letters and in newspapers at the time uh, to refer to sort of the general sense that the British government was violating either implicit or explicit promises they had made in colonial charters or just the general sense that they were doing things that the government shouldn't be allowed to do, even though there is no British constitution. But the phrase unconstitutional predates the US constitution. And I really love that. I love that we defined ourselves around the idea that like the government is doing stuff stuff it shouldn't do, even before we had a document that said this is what the government's allowed to do. Uh, and then lastly, I wish this was a bigger part of the book, but there's a great little bits and pieces in here about the smuggling efforts that go on throughout 1774 to bring in things like weapons and gunpowder from the Caribbean and from, uh, from we talked about the Dutch earlier, but actually a lot of it came from the Netherlands. Uh, and there's uh, a bit that happens at the end of every chapter uh, where there's this ongoing sense of alarm where she's reporting from primary documents, letters and stuff at the time. There's this kind of ongoing sense of alarm from the British Navy that like, oh, hey, you know, we keep encountering these ships from the Netherlands that say they're going to islands in the Caribbean. And then we find that they've got like a whole bunch of gunpowder that isn't officially listed on their register. Weird. And uh, yeah, we don't think that's all going to this little island in the Caribbean. So, hey, what do you guys think we should do about that? And there's this ongoing discussion on the British side or on the on the other side of the Atlantic about like, hmm. Wow, these like there's there's some weird smuggling stuff happening here. What's going to happen? And it's just sort of it, it's never, you know, it doesn't go beyond that. But uh, I would love to see a movie about like the smugglers in Europe who like helped fade like helped feed arms and weaponry to the American Revolution in the years before it actually kicked off. I was just the on the unconstitutional tip, one of the uh, fascinating wrinkles of that is that the colonies when they were still colonies um 
uh, basically created a constitutional-ish objection to laws governing uh, so-called seditious libel. Um, and, uh, and, you know, newspaper editors would serve heroically in jail, uh, but eventually courts in the colonies who were supposed to be serving the interests of the British kind of agreed with them. So like um, Americans, um, even before they were fully fledged Americans kind of created a different idea about what could or could not be, uh, criticizable, uh, in terms of the government and what the government could do back to them and creating a law that wasn't, uh, on the books at all in the UK. It still is like, so we had the free speech tradition much stronger than they did. Um, oh, even way back then, which is just kind of awesome. And Nick, you were saying, uh, I was just going to uh, add that uh, the reason I hate the Boston Tea Party is because it gave rise ultimately to the terrible sports team name, the Boston Tea Men in the old North American Soccer League, which I think is the start of the decline of naming conventions for professional sports teams in America. Wow. Um, uh, certainly no Anaheim Amigos, as far as I can tell. Um, yeah. uh, Eric, did, did, did the, the, the Philadelphians... And the uh, and the South Carolinians uh, use the phrase "mass holes," or did that have to? Come? <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't remember seeing that in there, but probably the uh, big uh, slur then was uh, Rhode Island was called Rogues Island oh. uh, in the colonial period Ooh. because they how uh, dare. Uh, they kept uh, putting tariffs like to go through <laughs> everybody. Nobody lives in Rhode Island, you know. You just pass through it, and so yeah. they would extort people on both ends of that tiny little state. And I think still now that's pretty much Rhode Island's purpose, right? Like there's a toll booth there on 95, yeah. and I think that's where all the they're doing a lot. Yeah. Doing a lot of the work. <laughs> yep, and um, billionaire uh, estates. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. My what am I consuming is uncharacteristically on point to this. Can I talk about it? Yeah. Um, I read uh, "Power and Liberty: Constitutionalism in the American Revolution" by Gordon Wood. And the reason I did that, and this is the, maybe the first time ever that this has worked, um, I went to a lovely dinner hosted by Liberty Fund in which Gordon Wood received the first George F. Will prize. Um, he uh, he had a lovely conversation with George Will where they talked about a bunch of these uh, the issues of early constitutionalism and um, kind of the the miracle of the American founding, if you will. And they gave they gave me a free book and I read it. You know, you go to these fancy parties and sometimes they give you a book and I'm always like, I already read this book or I'm never going to read this book. And shockingly, I actually was like, oh, let me crack this thing, see what's going on inside here. Um, it was pretty good. Uh, Gordon Wood was utterly charming. He is 90 years old. He was utterly charming and super, super on point in his, uh, in his talk at this dinner. And um, the one thing that he talked about which also makes an appearance in this book, um, which is a sort of short distillation of a lot of the writings through his career. So I had not really read much by him before. This was like a great um, primer for me. Um, he was asked the question by George Will, like, why why were all of these dudes just happened to be kind of like hanging out together at this moment? Um, you know, was there something special about this place that produced the conditions for the founding? And uh, he posited that it was the same reason that we got the Scottish Enlightenment, um, which was the the sort of power of defining yourself in opposition to the global power of um, of Britain at that moment um, created this kind of need to prove yourself, this sort of outsider thinking that all came together both to produce the Scottish Enlightenment and and the American founding um, style thinking. He further said uh, the same phenomenon was almost certainly at work um, in a certain cluster of uh, Midwestern American novelists later who define themselves in opposition to New York. So like we get Kurt Vonnegut for the same reason. You get Upton Sinclair for the same reason uh, or Sinclair Lewis for the same reason. I think it's like that's a cool idea, um, but it's a troubling idea for the entity that is now the great power that people might be defining themselves against. So who who is just outside of our borders? Whose identities are adjacent to our own? Who are the next big interesting thinkers uh, is a pretty cool question. But then to again, ask. also libertarianism, right? Kind maybe of way, maybe that does. <laughs> sort of I hope defines itself against. Certainly, yeah. we are outsiders. Yeah. Um, but Power and Liberty um, by Gordon Wood, really a very interesting read. I am not a history dad. Uh, I do not spend a lot of time reading about um, kind of uh, wars and the history adjacent to them. But this book really caught my attention. 
I'm sure uh, Gordon Wood uh, also understands that uh, punk rock was equally a, a, a rise of of rebellion against the empire. Against, yeah, against something, the empire something. of hippie dumb. Uh, also, something, something. <laughs> James Eric Joyce. Clapton, God, right? Uh, the yeah. British Empire gave us everything good by like by by being by mm. being the thing people, people wanted to be not against. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, honestly, yeah, no, that Ferguson was should write that. Yeah, I like an that. idea that he that he raised, and I think it's I pretty. Smart. Would pick a bone with his uh, understanding though of the revulsion of uh, novelists against urban because uh, uh, Sinclair Lewis left the homeland. That was the place of babbitry and Elbert Gantry. And moved to the city as did Theodore Dreiser, Sherwood Anderson, and things like that. It was uh, they were shitting on where they were from, which well, you is can be as old a it. trope as Oedipus Rex, right? You can be called by it, I think, and still powered by your yeah. relation to it. Uh, so, as a history dad, uh, what I have been consuming, I'm three episodes in, uh, but I can already recommend because it's really good, uh, is a PBS docu series called Civilizations. Um, which is um, basically going through the history of mankind, but through the lens of art. When does uh, the first representation, the first cave paintings, the first religious expressions, and so on. And if you have, like I have, uh, watched and recommended a lot of uh, similar series over, over time, you will see uh, characters that you've seen before. Mary Beard, most uh, most spectacularly, because she's just always like great and awesome, uh, talking about various things. But you will see things that you haven't seen um, in uh, in even uh, all those other series that you've watched. Uh, and it's a very nice um, uh, argument for art, just generally speaking. Like uh, like mankind needed to create art because there was stuff that he she couldn't fathom otherwise, or needed to express that needed to have this. And there's a in the episode I watched last night, um, there's this great thing I'd never seen before called like the Lion Man, which is like a 40,000 year old ivory sculpture of a half man, half lion, which I mean, let's face it was obviously carved by aliens, but um, it was carved out of a, a ivory tusk. And uh, this this insane German guy decided to to recreate it using the original tools. And uh, he's talking about it while he's doing it. And he's like, this must have taken four Forty thousand hours. He <laughs> he had gone mad clearly by trying to do it, and uh, they must have given him an exemption so that he didn't have to hunt for his tribe. Ah, um, but uh, very funny. Anyway, civilization, which PBS. is is the half lion. the The legs are lion, <laughs> and the top part of the body is man. Or uh, it's uh, a very erect. Is he wearing pants? Um, it's lioness erectus, um, wearing okay. pants. Got some like uh, knife scars in his face. It seems like too. It's an amazing uh, thing to look at. It's, it's deeply. Moving. I'm pretty sure the CIA funded that, Matt. Absolutely right. Um, they did, and uh, and that's why uh, we should uh, be thankful. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you all for listening and participating, and whatever else you did in the production of this podcast. We have a lot of podcasts now. Uh, go to reason.com/podcast to find out about them. Uh, and if you like what we do as an organization, please consider a tax deductible donation. If you can funnel it through Donors Trust if you want. Uh, w, just go to reason.com slash donate. Um, and we do a lot of events in New York and elsewhere. Nick, do you have anything you want to talk about in the uh, near future that's uh, worth uh, advertising here? Yeah, in the, in the near future, I want to talk about the uh, May 8th uh, live Reason interview that I'll be conducting with Kat Murty, uh, the executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. That's happening in Midtown Manhattan. It's going to be really great. Uh, it's co-sponsored by the Psychedelic Assembly. And uh, Kat Murdy has also worked at Cato in the past, or most recently, and she's a co-founder of Feminists for Liberty. Um, and SSDP is the largest student-based organization that fights for drug policy reform and a better relationship between society and drugs. Uh, it should be really great. So go to reason.com slash events to uh, find out more information and to buy a ticket. Terrific. Thank you very much, Eric Bame, for joining us. And we'll catch you back here next week. Goodbye.